Well, Novak Djokovic and some rowdy fans in the Australian Open crowd have taken things at this year's Aussie Open to the next level. Indeed, Novak Djokovic did play some scintillating and titillating tennis. And you know, the best thing about it is what they always say about the big three. It's not their ability to play so great that truly amazes us tennis fans, tennis pundits, and experts around the world alike. It is the fact that he's able to summon what it takes to be the best when he is at his worst. When he is at his worst, he finds a way to win. Yes, there was many things to ooh and ah at that delight the senses in uh, last night's play. And of course, we're uh, not too long away from uh, some bottom half draw action, but the top half is where all the action is. So we're happy to be here tonight and talk about the top half of the draw. Uh, like I said, uh, all the senses were delighted. The sights, the sounds. I can even smell it right now. Or maybe it's the fact that we're in a uh, subarctic freeze here in the southern part of the United States. And that's the smell of the space heater below uh, pointing at my feet with cat hair burning in it. I think, I think that's the smell I'm smelling. Anyways, let's take a look at this for delighting the senses. Look at that, man. Roger Federer picked him up with the On Clouds brand. I mean, that is, that is a, a full-figured man, a fine, a fine man. Look at the, the way his, his chest muscles, by the way, I'm wearing this Novak Djokovic shirt today to celebrate the victory. The way uh, Ben Shelton's chest muscles glisten underneath the tight shirt, soaked in the sweat under the Aussie open brutal sun. Now, before anyone comments below that Matt's gay, please, you don't, you don't have to do that. I've seen comments like that before. That's absolutely not true. I just... I can admire the male form, something I have in common with the French people, something something the Italian people, well, barbarians that they are, never understand or appreciate. That's why I drink this here French wine. This one's a, uh, a Bordeaux Supérieur. And I should mention that this, uh, this glass is a special glass, too, for Serbians and anyone from former, former Yugoslavia. I'm sure you've heard of the Count of Monte Cristo. Well, this one's, this came, <laughs> this glass came from the Count of Montenegro, actually. In fact, this is a very old glass, and I'm going to pour this uh, Vent de Francais in. This actually was a glass from Tito, Marshal Tito, after throwing the Nazis out of Yugoslavia in World War II. After throwing the Nazis out, he toasted his Yugoslavian people with this glass. And only one set of lips have touched this glass ever since then. Not mine, but mine will be the next to join it. No, of course, this, this glass was only touched by the lips of Novak Djokovic. After he got his record-making 24th slam, a friend of mine sent him a love letter saying what a big fan he was, and he sent this. But my friend said, you know what, Matt? I don't want to be the one who touches my lips to this glass that Nole touched, that Marshall Tito touched. No, Matt, I want it to be you. I call a toast to tennis fans around the world and to the one and true only goat, Novak Djokovic. Now your spirit and mine may finally become one. <laughs> uh, that's the end of that bottle of uh, Bordeaux Superieur. People are thinking, surely, Matt, this, that's got to be the weirdest intro I've ever done. I don't know what just came over me to do that intro. Uh, you know, it'd been so easy to just go to uh, Djokovic threatening to fight that guy in the crowd. But no, I had to take it somewhere else this time. Anyways, uh, let's take a look at this. I want to show you guys how close Novak Djokovic was to losing in case you didn't see every bit of that match. What a thriller it was. I know the Joker haters out there were really excited. Uh, Djokovic was this close. After, after uh, the second set... He comes back from 5-2 or 5-3 down, gets it on serve, 4-5, ends up getting broken. What a heartbreaker. In the third set, it looks like it happened. It could happen all over again. 4-5 serving to stay alive in the third set. Could go two sets to one down. Djokovic definitely didn't want that. Love 40, he comes back. I think he gets it to game point and blows it. Then another break point. Fourth time would be the charm. Second serve. Look at what Djokovic does. Hits the, line, hits the back of the line in the serve. Hits the side of the line on that. It, listen, James Blake. What a second serve. James Blake really liked that one. 
Uh, but that's that's the forehand you might have heard Djokovic talk about in his um I think it was on the on court with Jim Jim Courier here on the on the court interview with Jim Courier was talking about that was the forehand he got lucky that big pop up missed. Uh, you know I think Djokovic probably still could have won that point, but when you're under that kind of pressure, you'll take the uh, the free point on the missed forehand for sure. Now let's talk about Djokovic and the drunk fan. I mean, let's just listen to Djokovic talk about it. The person in the crowd said to you that... person in the crowd, what did he say to you? What what do you think about Novak? How did it make you feel? You don't want to know. (laughs) There was a lot of of things that were being told to me on the court, particularly I wonder, comment below if you can guess what he said. From that corner and and the same side, the other corner. Um, I was tolerating it from most of the match, but I, you know... And at one point, I had enough, and I asked him whether he wants to come down and tell it to my face, you know. And uh, you're a big guy, huh? When you you're a big somebody, you know. Uh, unfortunately, for this him, one of the he didn't have the courage to come down, you know. So and, and, and um, it's true too. That's what I was asking him, you know. If you have courage, if you're such mm-hmm. a you know, tough man, tough guy, come down and tell it to my face. Yes. Well, let's have a discussion about it. After he got into you know, it with him, so he had like he, half his you know, he, he had a half his in one pair. Away, and that's, that's all it is. If you are a big man, if you are a big man, you have the big courage, come to talk to me. Come tell me, come closer to tell me what you want to talk about. I, I'm curious, what would happen if a, a, a fan did, I mean, okay, we actually, I think we know what would happen if a fan jumped over and was like, okay, Djokovic, I want to fight you. I want to literally fight you. Uh... What would happen is Djokovic wouldn't really have to do much. Some security would probably tackle the guy to the ground. He'd have to fight them and then get uh, get dragged away. Anyways, listen to Nick Kyrgios. He had a unique take on the fight. He was talking to Djokovic. Djokovic says, hey, come back. Let's play doubles together. And Kyrgios had a better idea. Nick, right, you need to luck. come back. All right, good luck. Yeah, Nick, you, you're, yeah, come back, man. Come back. Let's play doubles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Bro, I'm ready. Let's do WWE in the crowd. I'll jump in for you. I'll go first. I'll get that guy out of here. <laughs> oh, man. I'd love that. Get a popcorn and watch that. Absolutely. Get a popcorn and watch that. Um, also, uh, they kind of buried the lead. That was um, Joker Nole Media. That, that guy does great. Whoever that is, I don't know him. Uh, Joker Nole Media guy, if you happen to be watching this, I'm flattered. But uh, I, I like uh, what you do because he always gets um, press conference stuff up really fast. So if you want to hear what... Joker has to say after a big match. You can always find it with uh, Joker Nole Media YouTube channel. Anyways, um, I think he missed the lead a little bit, though. I know, obviously, this is what everyone wants to hear about. Say it to my face, you coward. Joker didn't exactly say that, but I won't go and call it clickbait. He got close. But um, I thought he buried the lead because in that press conference, Djokovic said something even more, interest, more interesting to me than what he said about, uh, about the guy who um, was heckling him. Let's see if anyone remembers this old classic. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. Sounds, sounds very believable. I think, I think I believe him. He probably didn't. Now, obviously, Bill Clinton did have to come clean later. In fact, he did have relations with that woman. But Djokovic, Djokovic Novak Djokovic, he's coming clean right away in this press conference. Listen to this admission to the botanical gardens uh, between matches. Um, we heard from the... locals that um, they think there's a particular tree near the gardens there that you like to visit. where he takes a meditate. secret lover? Um, is that true? And can you tell us a bit more about it, that? It is true. It is true. There is, there's one particular tree that I've been uh, having Wait. special relationship with, so to Wait. say, in the last 15 Wait. years. What? What? He's having sexual relations not with a person in the botanical gardens by a tree. He's having sexual relations with the actual tree. Anyways, I thought some people might have missed that, and uh, the lead was buried on that one. Uh, let's move on to some bigger news with the Nole match. Stretching out the wrist again. A bad sign for Joker Nole, but probably a badder sign is the um, blowing the nose, having the sniffles. He's obviously got a cold or something. So Jim Courier, Jim Courier here tried to ask him, uh, kind of tried to s- slide this one in and ask Djokovic about it. You know Djokovic doesn't want to admit any uh, weaknesses in the middle of a tournament, talk about anything that's bothering him. So let's see how uh, Djokovic uh, handled this one. you feel like this year you can find that extra gear, maybe better health? We see you sniffling a little bit. What's it going to take for you to hit that next level that can get you to the finish line? snuck that in. I, I, I sincerely hope so, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's going to take. Uh, for me to go deep in the tournament. I mean, I haven't been playing my and best. And then he doesn't answer the I'm question. I'm still trying to find a form 
but you know. He started the question uh, by saying you've lost uh, sets in the first two rounds before and still won a major. You play players that have nothing to lose, really. You know, they come out on the center this court trying to play their best, best match, best tennis. And you know, I think both my first and second round opponents uh, were really, really uh, great quality tennis players. And managed to, to find a way to win four. That, that's what counts in the end. Hopefully, I'll be able to build this as tournament progresses. So think about like TFO. He lost to Mac, who uh, was playing pretty well. Forehand is a little questionable, but he played better than on average, including, uh, I think, on match point. He hit a great backhand. TFO gave him a shorter ball. Mahak, Mahak, if I, I hope I'm saying it right, he jumps in the air and slaps a forehand. I think TFO's like, well, it's supposed to be the weak side. What's going on? Then TFO hits a ball long. You know, I, I bring him up because what Djokovic said is so true. It's not just um, what we always hear. I got to get this thing just right. Djokovic, after he got in a tussle with that fan, he had like half his collar Benoit Pair style and the other half down. Anyways, um, you know, they, they play well when they're not at their best, when they're when Djokovic has a cold, he's having some kind of issues, probably small, but any issue at all, you don't like it out there when you're playing a tennis match. You have an issue with the wrist. Uh, but the other thing that is so impressive about these top guys is that they they play these players who have absolutely nothing to lose, as Djokovic was pointing out there. It's so it's got to be so easy to swing uh, really free when you go out there, and, and especially if you're Popperin, you know. Mahak doesn't have the firepower that uh, Popperin has. TFO probably felt like he had a lot to lose, and Mr. Mahak probably didn't. And I think that, uh, you know, is always a factor. And you always see uh, the big three and other other top players, you know, someone like uh, like a Tom, uh, Tomas Burdich, you know, uh, Sanga always did it for years. Uh, I, I can David Ferrer, I could name a bunch of players, but they would hang in there and take care of that. They would win the matches that they were supposed to win. Not every top 30, top 20 player uh, always manages to do that. Anyways, like Joe said, they really have nothing to lose and they can swing freely. And then when you're like popperin and you get that kind of firepower on the serve and the forehand and move really well, if you feel free, you can be very dangerous. And if things aren't going perfect for Djokovic with his health, his fitness, whatever, uh, it, it can be a problem, as we saw. But good on Djokovic. Not at his best. I think he's going to be able to weather the storm, although supposedly his next match could be dangerous. We're going to look at that in a second. I think he can weather the storm until when he faces um, some top players like Yannick Sinner. Maybe that will happen. Uh, I think he'll be feeling a lot better by then, as we've seen him do so many times in the past. Maybe... Maybe some people are, are saying things like, well, Djokovic is older now and time is finally going to catch him, but I don't think it's going to catch him yet. Uh, let's look at this. What did Big Papa Popperin do to uh, help him win this match? Well, here's some stats. We see this often. Someone loses the first set, turn it around, end up winning the match or winning the second set in this case, only the second set in this case. 18% uh, of the time, Popperin's taken uh, the shots inside the baseline. Half the time, almost 45%, he's, you know, within, what is that, within six feet behind the baseline. And almost 40% of the time, pretty pretty damn close to half also, he is more than six feet behind the baseline. That's not going to work with Djokovic. Djokovic is so good at moving you around. And then when, once you back up, Djokovic, I mean, I, I remember seeing, uh, as soon as I tuned in, you know, it was, it was freezing this morning. It was, for you Europeans out there, I think it was negative 10, negative 9.8 C. It was uh, 13 Fahrenheit here in the morning. Anyways, when I got down there, uh, I didn't see the match from the very beginning live. I went back and watched. I watched everything. You know, I watched most of the matches today and all of that Djokovic match later. But w when I came down and saw it live, I think it was in the third set. Yeah, it was in the third set when I came in and saw it live. And Djokovic looked like he was in a little trouble to me. And then in the middle of a rally, there was a little space. Popperin was far enough aback, and Djokovic just rips this, not even rips it, hits it smoothly, early, and with the perfect angle. If you back up into that beyond six feet behind the baseline, Djokovic will just start eating you up with those angles on the ground strokes, forehand, backhand, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyways, this is what Popperin did in set two. Now, it's interesting to me that he's behind the six feet mark even more. Like, sometimes you do have to back up there to try to contain when you go on defense, when you hit, let's say you hit a bad shot, you know, like, okay, you're about to be in trouble. Sometimes you got to back up, hope they don't hit a drop shot, and you got to try to contain uh, the enemy. But uh, compared to set one, playing just kind of waiting for it at the baseline went away. That drops to 20% from 45. 
And instead of 18% inside the baseline, it's 35% of the time inside the baseline. Now, I've said this before. I feel like I've put the same stat up for a million player, uh, hundreds of players over the years doing this show. This time I thought, you know, like what changed? Let's look at the stats overall. What happened for Popper? And, you know, it's not as simple as I'm the coach. Hey, Popper, uh, when you hit your forehand, get inside the baseline. Well, you know, if you hit a crappy shot, you can't do that. You got to do certain things right. So I think it all goes down to the serve and the return, of course, too. But when you're serving, definitely on the serve. If we look at set one, Big Popper's only getting 50% of his big pop and first serves in. He's winning 57% of the time on the first and 57 as well on the second. Djokovic getting the first serves in 70% of the time, winning almost 100%, 94. We go to set two, and that number jumps from 50% in to 63% of the first serves in and winning 80% of the first serves. So I think a big factor in what you saw in those um where he's taking the ball percentages, the the you know the the stats we showed earlier, I think he's just getting more first serves in and he's using it the right way, he's using taking advantage of the first serves going in, taking the ball a little earlier. You know if you hit a, a good serve and you get your spot, there's a good chance you can hit that ball inside the baseline. Sometimes you got to be a little more proactive with your footwork to actually make that happen, uh, especially at my level of play. You'll definitely see people kind of waste it, hit a good serve, and then just kind of wait for the ball to come to them. Even if they're right on top of the baseline, you know, they can do damage from there. But you got to be very proactive. You got to recognize, oh, the short ball is coming off of this big serve I just hit. And you got to move in there and do things. Anyways, I think that's what he did. Uh, interesting, though, if we go to set three, he goes from 60, 63% first serves in to 66 and wins 80% still. So, like, how does he end up losing the set? Well, do remember, set three was extremely close. He, he only breaks him, you know, once in the second. He only breaks him once in the third set. I'd say the, the big difference there, and maybe this is, uh, I'd like to see, like, where some of these second serve points came into play. Maybe some in the tiebreak where Djokovic won. But the big difference there is Djokovic is getting into that second serve, uh, you know, considerable amount, 13% less win on second serve number there. Uh, anyways... Let's, uh, I guess some more Djokovic talking about the drunk fan. Uh, let's skip that, but let's go to this. Djokovic talking about his next opponent. Have you seen him playing here? Thomas Echeverry, that is, the some, next opponent. Some wars? I, I didn't, no, I didn't see him playing, but he beat Monfils and Murray and quite comfortably, actually, both matches. So I will have to do my homework and see how, uh, how he played those matches. But, uh... You got to do your homework in this sport. Yeah, results are, are really... Impressive, you know, he's obviously playing maybe tennis of his life on the hard court. This is key. And uh, Thomas is a great guy, you know, I, I get along very well with him and his team. Obviously on the court, you know, we're going to be opponents, so... Uh, he said, it, uh, the key, what I'm talking win, about, so is he I, said he's playing the tennis of his life on the hard courts. Uh, here's a comment. Session Paul says, I'm sorry, talking about me. This guy talks like he stopped watching tennis around 2020. Didn't you predict Murray to beat Echeverry? Uh, who's been amazing in the last year, Alcaraz will win this AO. I'm a huge Novak fan, but time is here. A 36-year-old cannot hold off a 20-year-old forever. Yes, I told you. I told you some people are saying that time is going to finally beat Djokovic at this time. You know, when Federer won in 2017 and 2018, his last three majors, wasn't he 36? I don't... I think when you got the talent and, and you know, Djokovic is a, a healthier 36 than uh, Federer was. Uh, or, or at least comparable. Shit. Shiza. <laughs> Anyways, I try not. It's a family show. Uh, so, yeah, he had a good year last year, but his best result was on clay. And this is a guy who's had all of his best results on clay. If you look at his record, his uh, he's under 500 on hard courts and grass, indoor courts. His, all of his best results come on clay. Yes, as Djokovic has pointed out, he's playing the tennis of his life on a hard court. But, um... He didn't have any huge results. He made some finals last year on clay. He made the quarterfinals at the French on clay, obviously. Uh, he did He did lose to Andy Murray on a hard court last year. Uh, he did have a lot of early exits, first-round exits on hard courts last year. I think he did. If you look at all of his, uh, his matches from last year, he had one uh, hard court match. I think he beat Seb Korda. Is that really such a big deal? This guy loses all the time. He almost lost in the first round, Seb Korda. Obviously, it, it's mental with him. With Corda, uh, I, I didn't even realize how close Corda's uh, uh, first round was. He was down 2-0. I think he was down. He was down 1-0 serving. Then he hit three double faults in a row. Is is what I understand happened for Corda. 
Anyways, so yeah, he beat Cord on a hard court. He had a, a couple good results on hard courts last year, and he's doing well here now. Uh, anyway, so I did my homework and looked at him, and this is why I predicted Murray. Look, take a look at this. This, this is the crowd. Echeverry is playing Monfils. And um, look at the crowd. You know, this is why I thought Echeverry wouldn't win. You know, it was tough on Djokovic to play an Aussie guy in these uh, – in these circumstances, for Djokovic having the wrist hurt and being sick, he's obviously sick, he's blowing his nose, you can hear him doing that in the press conference after he makes his answers. Uh, to play an Aussie when you're not at your best and the crowd is really against you, and I know Djokovic is used to it, crowds are against him pretty oftenly, but still, uh, I think it was a tough environment, and I didn't think Mr. Uh, Etch uh, Sketchaberry would be able to win uh, against Murray or Monfils, I mean, Monfils, I don't put too much faith in, but, you know, we saw, uh, we've seen some Monfils be able to not make a run in the majors lately, but be able to dig in and at least say, I'm not going to lose to this guy today. You know, I've done great things in my career. I'm not losing to Sketchaberry today. I uh, wasn't able to do that, even though, um, you know, for straight sets, it felt close at times. Monfils showed that he had more firepower than Echeverry, that he could, um, you know, hit winners on demand against him at times. But Echeverry, very solid. I mean, looks like a clay court guy. He's able to hit really nice ground strokes. He's not super powerful, but he's hitting a nice ball, keeping it deep, very consistent, uh, has a pretty good slice backhand, I would say. It just to me, it's not not the kind of things that can bother uh, Novak Djokovic. And it's not like his uh, serve is anything like uh, Popperin, Alexi Popperin's serve. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so when... I didn't think Echeverry would come through Murray just because, uh, you know, it's not an Aussie, but it's someone that everyone, you know, knows and, and loves in Australia. Remember when Murray said, I'm retiring for the hip surgery, and this is my last match happened in Australia. The crowd got, uh, you know, behind him big time in that match. Anyways, uh, so I thought that with Monfils, you see this party atmosphere, people are going crazy, but it didn't bother uh, Mr. Echeverry. So uh, I would say that uh, he has a no chance to beat Novak Djokovic, and unless Djokovic's wrist becomes uh drastically worse all right uh let's look at um let's look at the draw and talk about the future of the top half half uh, I think matches are already by the time you're watching this matches have already begun for a second round on the bottom half so we'll I won't be around tomorrow pop maybe I could sneak a, a quick show in but probably unlikely but we'll be back Friday to talk about what happened in the bottom half in the second round and uh, uh obviously third round matches by then too. Uh, I got one comment, though, I wanted to read. Talking about this party atmosphere, they got more attendance than ever. Well, for the real, you know, they're trying to they're trying to make money and sell a lot of grounds passes for you're not your typical tennis fan. People just want to have a good time. It's summer there. This fella here, he's in Melbourne, and uh, his name's Kennedy9599. He made a comment down below. You can comment down below as well. Uh, and I thought it was a pretty good comment because he's telling us what it's like on the grounds right now. He's been there. I've been going to the AO for every year, the last 10-plus years, says Kennedy. This year is the worst it's been, in my opinion, because there are too many people. Basically, if you get access only to the outside courts, you'll have to get there really early to not have to wait in line for super long. Matches between players who I've never even heard of, qualifiers, lesser-known non-Australian players, packed with people. I waited over one hour just to watch Monfils the other day. The line was literally hundreds of meters long before he even got on court. Uh, it'll quiet down in the second week like it usually does, but that's when they stop putting men's and women's singles matches on outside courts. And then they usually do like juniors or wheelchair tennis or something like that. And only on the stadium courts. I hope they realize they can't just sell an unlimited amount of grounds passes just to make more money. It's way too hard to access matches even on the small courts. So interesting fan perspective. If you're going to the Aussie Open anytime soon this year, next year, I would recommend, uh, like all tournaments, you got to at least get a decent seat. And honestly, I was just at the U.S. Open last year and saw uh, this match, Blake Shelton and Djokovic, and I didn't have a good seat. I was in the top section, but relatively close for the top section, you know, like row seven or something like that. And it actually wasn't that bad. So I would just say make sure you have a ticket to get into the big courts because then you know you got a guaranteed seat. It's always fun to walk around the grounds and try to get in. But even in Cincinnati... Courts with uh, any matches that are semi-interesting are just packed and hard to get into. And I, I believe it. I bet it's worse than ever uh, at the Aussie this year. Anyways, let's uh let's skim through the um let's skim through the top half of the draw really quick and just preview what is to come and then we'll get out of here. 
Uh, Djokovic and Echeverry, we just pretty much talked about that. I, I don't see it happening. I know he's having the, the time of his life on hard courts, but I, don't, I just can't see a scenario where Djokovic loses to him. I think Popperin had a better shot than uh, any of these guys. Manorino beat Jama Munar. Manorino has now played 10 sets in about mm, five days' time with the extra day by the time he gets out there. Uh, ben Shelton is going to handle him. I did hear Darren Cahill talking about in the broadcast how uh, Manorino will be tricky for Shelton, but he does think Shelton will win. And he said, put it this way, every time I've coached a player who's had to play Manorino, as soon as the match is over, they wanted to hit the practice court immediately to find some rhythm in their strokes again. Because with all the off-speed, weird shots you get from Manorino, he makes you uncomfortable. He makes you lose your rhythm. These guys are used to going out there and hitting with other people to hit the ball hard at them. Manorino hits a different ball. And so uh, I thought that was interesting to point out. I think uh, one good thing about Shelton, they're both lefties, so that kind of neutralizes some of what Manorino is trying to do. Maybe you could argue that it neutralizes a little bit the other way, too, for uh, for Manorino in his favor. Taylor Fritz, get the lucky loser Hugo Gaston, the guy who's uh, addicted to the drop shot. French fellow who probably uh, also admires the male form and Bordeaux Superior. I've been to France, and that's... um. That's how they taste wine. Uh, anyways, uh, Fabian took out Sorondolo. Sorondolo didn't look that good against Sweeney. Most of his results last year came earlier. End of the year wasn't too great for him. Uh, I think he'll be okay, though. Anyways, uh, I mean, that does suck for him, though, because he's had good hardcore results. He should have been able to come through. But uh, Fabian, I, mean, I swear, correct me if I'm wrong, comment below. Didn't this Fabian, Fabian Marosan guy, didn't he beat Djokovic last year? It was in a smaller tournament, but he had a huge upset. It wasn't Joker. Was it Joker? I can't remember. Uh, Taylor Fritz. Can he beat Marosan? I don't know. I'm feeling the upset. Uh, Musetti went. I told you guys this uh, Luca von Asha. He's actually French, but he's got a Dutch name. I don't know what the deal is. I hope he keeps winning. We'll find out more about him as he keeps winning. I like him. I've seen him uh, uh, enough last year to know that this guy is going to be a, a top player, I think. Anyways, uh, Luca von Arschlau will probably lose to Sitsipas, but Sitsipas doesn't look at his best yet. So a little question mark on that one. Uh, Yannick Sinner beat a couple uh, orange guys. He's got Baez. Baez had a good year last year. I don't... Sinner's coming through. TFO out. Mahak. Mahak was impressive. Uh, one thing I liked, the whoever it might have been Darren Cahill, commentators, I can't remember who they were, but someone said, it might have been Patrick McEnroe, said Mahak was like Bjorn Borg today. Guy showed no emotion, just focused on getting the job done. Uh, I give him a chance against Hatchinoff. They were both guys with in their names. But, uh, you know, Hatchinoff is a, a great player, so that's a, that's a, I mean, I guess you got to go with Hatchinoff if we have to pick somebody, but Give him a hack a chance. He looked awesome in that TFO match. I saw a good bit about that. The Demon in an Italian qualifier. What a surprise. Caboli. Uh, we'll take the, the little rat in that one. Corda and Rubles. And that's about it. Hit the music. We're getting out of here. Uh, <laughs> it's a tough one to pick. Normally, I'm against Corda all the time. Corda has everything it takes. You know, this game is so mental. Corda is proof on that. I, I was in Cincinnati with Pete, Peter Tennis Freeman last year, and we were doing our tennis clinic, and there's one teaching pro there who was this guy that was a top player in the state of Ohio, and he, you know, was a, a top junior, and was, uh, you know, people thought this is a guy who could maybe uh, make it on tour, I, I don't know how far he went. Maybe he, you know, maybe he was ranked a thousand in the world or something like that. I'm not sure, but he, he's very good. He's very good, and he knows a lot about tennis. So one day I saw him there, and I said, "Why does everyone think Sebastian Corda is going to succeed? You know, what, what what's the deal with this guy? Because he seemed to know a lot about Corda and what went into developing him as a player." And he said, "It's simple, you know. Um, kind of like I remember a story like this about Felix Auger Aliassi." Pete was telling me about this, actually. Uh, Felix has a team, and when he wakes up in the morning, his team is there, and they're stretching. They're grabbing his leg and stretching it out. I'm wearing uh, fancy wool slippers because it's very cold here. I just revealed my shoes, something I never do. 
They're Asics now, though, normally, in support of Djokovic. And because Nike, they, they made their shoes too expensive, too crappy. The quality went down. The price went up. I switched to Asics. Got to say I'm very happy. Anyways, um, Felix, the whole team is focused on his success. They're stretching him out in the morning. You know, all the pieces are there. Why can't he win? Well, it's obviously mental. Maybe Felix will do better at this Australian Open. Or did he already lose? I'm not sure. Uh, so with Seb Korda, this fella in Cincinnati, really good tennis player. This is a guy who, um, you know, they used to have him hit with pros when they came to play the Cincinnati tournament. He'd be one of those players to say, here's a young guy for you to practice with. He's really good. And he told me that Korda, so much money has been put into developing him and his career. And they've just... You know, his whole life has been revolving around tennis and there's just no way he could fail. And and to me, when you have all those pressures and uh, expectations from a young age, I think it might make it might make it easier to fail. Like look at how so many top juniors we've never heard of, you know, guys who were number 1 in the world. I remember the first time I saw this was a guy his name was Christian Pless, I think, something like that. And they were talking about how he really was uh failing on tour trying to make it into the top 100 and stay there right and he's playing Andy, Andy Roddick and he got his ass kicked and I never saw a match with him again but I remember them saying how I, I'm pretty sure they said he was a number one player in the world in juniors and just never could make it work at the pro level you know there's a difference in the pros a lot of times like Pete Sampras they say he used to lose to Michael Chang all the time in the juniors but when he got to the pros he did a lot better and sometimes it's better in the junior level to develop your tools that are going to help you at the pro level, even though there might be ways to win right now in the juniors you could focus on, but long term, that's not the best way. And I'm not I'm not saying that's exactly what happened with Seb Court. I'm just saying, like with those guys, I think when um, there's all these expectations, oh, you were number one in the world as a junior, so you're definitely going to make it, it might make it even harder to make it mentally. And so maybe with these guys where the whole family's behind them, all this money's going to develop them, Maybe it, um, <coughs> excuse me, maybe it builds up the pressure too much and, uh, and it makes it really tough mentally. It's already so hard out there uh, in this game, in tennis. Anyways, thanks for joining us. Like I said, we'll probably uh, see you on Friday to talk about third round action and the rest of the second round matches. Uh, I hope uh, after you watch this, you watch all the tennis tonight. We'll be back. See ya!